BioBalance HealthCast, episode 143, Personalized Medicine. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. This week, Kathy and I are going to be talking about uh, research protocols in scientific research, in educational research, and in medical research. And we're talking about it because of an article that was recently in the uh, uh, Journal of American Medical Association, right. Right. JAMA, mm-hmm. uh, that was written by Dr. Jeff Goldberger and Dr. Alfred Buxton, comparing uh, evidence-based guidelines for medicine versus personalized uh, guidelines for medicine, or personalized medical treatment. And what the distinctions that they drew are, I think, is significant for the way medicine will be practiced going forward. Uh, there are uh, conflicting fields of influence that go through uh, medical practice and, and the stresses and strains of those as doctors and patients try to find their way is something that we are always fascinated by as we do this podcast and, and almost always to make the point that it's really critically important for you to be an informed and participatory consumer. So for that to happen, you need to know a little bit about the research that's done and how the guidelines are formulated and, and what you can do as you assess what your doctor is doing or as you talk to your doctor about the treatment plans that he has for you and whatever illnesses you may be dealing with. I'd, li- I'd like to talk about a little bit about the history of how doctors have treated you. Yes. Okay. So the history was, and even when I was in medical school, but way back when, it was even more more individualized. Doctors would be your doctor for life and they would send you to a colleague that they knew very well and that colleague knew how your doctor practiced right. and then if they needed specialists they'd go to their colleague you'd go to their colleague they would then have a communication by letter or, or phone about you and what they wanted to get out of the visit and what they were concerned about that's how I was trained. That's back in the 70s, and into and my residency ended on in 1985. So 70s through early 80s, that's how we were trained. We didn't have specific guidelines at that point. They were just being developed, mm-hmm. and those guidelines were: if you do A, B, C, D, E, and F for a particular problem, then you have fulfilled the minimal level of care. Mm-hmm. So it was basically, what do you need to do to provide good medicine to somebody, but just the minimal amount. On top of that, you can then use your own judgment, basically, to look at the patient and decide what they need. You know, So it used to be all, all personal. Sort of the art of medicine. The what art of medicine or? with the science. The science was taught mm-hmm. to the doctors. They kept up. We all kept up. But It was taking the information and then applying it to our patient. Then we entered guidelines in the 80s. And now we're entering the world of this is exactly how you should do it. And that's called evidence-based medicine. So basically, if you don't do this, that's going to be a problem. We'll tell you why. There's lots of different areas why it's going to be a problem. Some of us have taken the tack that the guidelines are the minimum, but we're going to go above and beyond and personalize the medicine for well, a patient. you put your knowledge and expertise on top of what the guideline is. Right. And where those intersections don't match, you follow your knowledge and expertise. But you do that at a risk to you. Well, and, yeah. And we'll, I mean, we'll talk that's, about why that's mm-hmm. so. Uh, so that's what we're really talking about. What kind of medicine is your doctor practicing? Are you getting a computerized list of treatments or are you getting basic guidelines plus individualized medicine. Well, and it's not just your doctor. It's also the hospitals mm-hmm. and the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance company. Uh, a friend of mine yeah. I was talking to yesterday, her brother just had, he's in his 60s, just had a hip replacement surgery uh, Wednesday of this week, mm-hmm. and they're sending him home Thursday afternoon from the hospital after a hip replacement in his 60s. And that's what the guidelines call for now. And that may be okay for one patient, but it's not okay for every patient. Exactly. And so they limit what they pay. They say, you're out. 
We're not paying for any more That's days. That's right. And, and if you want to stay or if your doctor wants you to stay, then they have to jump through a number of hoops to identify alternate concerns or issues. Yes, you went in for a hip replacement, but you also have a pacemaker and they mm -hmm. need to make sure that, you know, whatever medicines they've been giving you to put you to sleep and kill your pains and so on, haven't messed with the pacemaker. Uh, and you've developed a fever and a cough. And then you have you know, to pitch, so, you have to pitch, you have to be a lawyer, an advocate. You have yes. to uh, advocate for your patient why they have to stay in the hospital. So here's the real, the real message is, Doctors don't have to send you out of the hospital. The issue is, is the hospital going to get paid? Right. The hospital can't discharge you. Only a doctor can discharge you. And I have to tell you that I never sent somebody out because the hospital told me to. Mm -hmm. Never. If they could go home, great. If they couldn't go home, they I discussed home. it with the patient. Right. They did not go home. And I mean, I just told the, there's all these people that call you and try to because tell you to of send evidence -based parameters. medicine. You know, yeah. the, the computer tells us this is good for two days. So we give you two days of coverage. And you say, but my particular patient needs three days or three and a half days. Well, but the computer says two days. I didn't so even do the conversation. I'm yeah. just not discharging them. And they told me to, di the insurance company would call me and yell at me. And I'd say, you come over here, yeah. you evaluate the patient, you put your name on the page because it's your, it's not, it's my license on the line. And it's my patient, and I have a loyalty to my patient, not to you. Same, so, thing, same thing happened to me years ago with a patient that was suicidally depressed. And I was seeing this patient, and they had an insurance company that required me to request a number of sessions every so many mm -hmm. sessions and to justify it to a panel, a committee, because they said, Man, you're, you, this is running longer than it should run. According and the committee to may not even guidelines. be counselors so then they, then <laughs> or they doctors. Call, they called me and they said, do you not understand that she has a lifetime cap? And if she burns through the lifetime cap, then she can't get coverage anymore. And I said, that's not my business. If she kills herself, she won't need a lifetime cap. <laughs> and they said, oh. <laughs> you know, there, so, so there's a conflict between the people that hold the money yes. and, and the doctor. There's a conflict between the hospitals who are getting paid the money. I mean, you're not paid by the hospital if you're a doctor. You're right. paid by the insurance company of your patient. So there are two different conflicting problems that yeah. put pressure on the doctor. And then Unless doctors you're a are, hospitalist. Well, that's true. If you're employed by the hospital, if you're an ER doctor or a hospitalist, that's different. But some hospitalists are independent. Mm. They contract with the hospital. Okay. And some ER doctors are as well. Yeah. So it's not every time. You don't know exactly. But one question you could ask is, are you my advocate or are you the advocate for the insurance company? Exactly. I think that's a reasonable thing to ask. Yeah. And if they say, well, then you're going to get a bill, you're not getting a bill for the balance. You just won't because yeah. you've got your insurance company. So sometimes the hospital gets the benefit of people going home early. Sometimes they get the problem of people going home late, but it evens out. Okay. So, so that's, so that's where, my So where are we going sermon. trying to make sense out of this and make it understandable? First of all, let's talk a little bit about how uh, research protocols are established. If you are a scientist, an educator, a physician who's trying to do research on something, you are fascinated by heart disease, you're a cardiac surgeon, and you want to do some research on uh, a particular issue involving heart problems, you have to narrow it down. So you write what's called a research protocol, you submit it for approval and funding, you get a grant to do it, and then you conduct your study. Mm -hmm. So the, the questions that you have to be able to answer for somebody to give you a grant and permission to conduct the research. One, you have to identify one thing that you're trying to study. What specific subset of all things to do with hearts are you going to be looking at? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a, a medical reaction, a physiological issue, a genetic issue. Is it necessary? Right. Does it help? Right. Does it not help? Is it, it is an effective method over and above an old, another method? Then you have to define your control population. You have to take a set of people, because in order to conduct a study, you have to have a control group to which nothing is done, and then you have mm -hmm. to have subgroups to which different things are done that you track. This one was given aspirin. This one was given uh, codeine. This one was given diet. You know, to, to honestly, try to they only let you do one thing. The variables. You have a. You have a. I mean, in medicine, it's nothing or one treatment. Okay. Rarely do they let you do several Multiple treatments things. at once, mm -hmm. unless you're in like the WHI study or, or one of the huge studies that incorporate the entire country. Okay. 
they only have one one thing you can do to that that group of people and that group of people has to look just like this group of people that you do nothing to. Okay. So in medicine so it's a little more example, narrow. So for example, if you decided you wanted to find out if iodine administered to this population of at-risk heart patients would prevent recurrence of heart attacks in a mm -hmm. five-year window. You write all that up, you select a control population of people that have had previous heart conditions mm -hmm. who are willing to participate, and those people you give, you manipulate one variable. They either mm -hmm. do get iodine or they don't get iodine. They also can't have all, a lot of other things. They can mm -hmm. only have heart disease. So, so in reality, people have multiple things. They have right. real you know, blood. <laughs> yeah, real people have yeah. blood pressure or kidney problems or or all you know allergies and take other medicines. But mm -hmm. in the study, you have to find people who only have one problem, mm -hmm. take very few or no other medications except for their heart, and excuse me, and have those two groups look just like alike. Right. So you're not really testing reality. You're testing a group. So you change one thing. And where you are in the country matters because you're, that's the next thing. Your group that you test, mm -hmm. the population you test is important because some places in the country say iodine. We've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. Iodine is, is not present in the Midwest. So people who don't have any iodine and are given iodine are more likely to respond mm -hmm. to anything, I mean, that involves thyroid or and thyroid does help heart heart patients. So if iodine, if this test was done in the Midwest and they come up with, yes, iodine helps heart patients and you should give it to them, and then you try to make that the same thing for everybody, well, on the coast, they've got plenty of iodine in their food. Mm -hmm. They have it in their water, they have it in their, in their food, mm -hmm. and see, they eat more seafood and it's fresh. So in those populations, it may not work. Right. And this is not a study, we're not talking about one that's being conducted, we're talking about an imaginary a hypothetical. one. hypothetical, yeah. So that's important, you know, in terms of somebody says these things work. Well, they may work for people here, but they don't work for people there. And that's one of the things the article was stressing is right. how can we go by guidelines when they look at one population? And, and then you identify this population, you identify the variable, you do what you do, and then you have to analyze your data. Mm -hmm. And part of the analysis that you do has to be on, on uh, consistency of implementation. I mean, if you have a subject population, you say take iodine every day at 10 o'clock in the morning, some of them will, some of them won't. Mm -hmm. Some will do it three days a week, some will do it seven days. And so you have to be able to track that mm -hmm. too to account Compliance. for your results. Mm -hmm. So then you get your results and you say, oh my gosh, iodine does or doesn't help heart attack people in this percent of, of increments over this period of time. And you set up a guideline. A regulatory agency comes in and looks at your data, mm -hmm. if they approve it, and they say, okay, the standard of care for treating 50-year-old uh, white men who are obese, who have heart problems, is to give them, because that was your population set up. Over 50. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, the, whatever it is you were, you were testing. So then doctors all over the country receive that information and they get some guy comes into the emergency room who's 50 plus years old, he's obese and he's having a heart problem and they look in the computer and the computer says, give them XYZ. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily know that individual. They don't no, know. it's, it's just mean, a matter of here's a list of things you do to that person. Well, it, just like in, in my business, which is, is counseling, uh, if somebody shows up, a homeless person shows up at an emergency room in, in unconscious, uh, suffering from uh, a suicide attempt as a result of depression. And they have no medical history. They know nothing about this person. They don't know what medicines they're on, mm -hmm. what drugs they're on, or anything else. What's the standard of care? What, what does the I protocol call I don't know the standard for. for that. And so they, they have to figure that out. And they have to figure, do we give medicines or what have you? Same thing for me and my business. In, in, in doing that kind of counseling for that kind of population, the at-risk issue for me is, do they kill themselves? The at-risk issue is, did I follow what is called the standard of care for treatment? Mm -hmm. Did I follow the evidence-based guidelines? Mm -hmm. Was I negligent? Not was I good at my job, did I help them stay alive, right. but did I do what the standard of care mm -hmm. called for? So if I were sued, I would have to defend myself by saying, here's the guideline, mm -hmm. I followed the guideline. Right. So, that's, so usually then you're okay, but if you have a good outcome. <laughs> yeah, I got a dead patient, but boy, I'm okay. Yeah, that's right. So you then know? there and, would and be I'm no... And I'm concerned about that. I know. I'm concerned about it too because it doesn't take into account the individual. Yes. And the individual's 
specific genetic background. I mean, it's like, if I was talking to you earlier about this, if you look at the United States, there are different groups of people from, that have origins in Europe that go to certain parts of the United States to live. I mean, they feel comfortable and like Northern Europeans go to Minnesota and South Dakota and mm -hmm. Uh, there's a big population of Scandinavians in Seattle. I'm the only brunette walking the streets in Seattle when I, or it appears that when I'm there. I mean, it's everybody's a real blonde. It's scary. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I you stand out. But but those all those populations have different genetic backgrounds. Diff they have different blood types. Many of uh, the world population. If you look at the world population, they say the blood type that's most common in, is O. If you look at Middle United States, the breadbasket, the common, the most common blood type is A positive, because okay. the, the agrarian populations in Europe were mostly A positive. It gave them an advantage to be A positive, to live in a agrarian settled society. Right. There's very few Bs and ABs because those are um, Asian, Russian. Uh, some of the some of the people that came across Russia and then went to the Philippines. There's a lot of AB and B. Okay. So, 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 so this, they all have different reactions. Kath, Kathy's example. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, because it's a perfect lead in to the other side of the coin. You can do your medical practice as an evidence based physician following the regulatory protocols mm -hmm. of the government and the insurance companies. And, and then the you'll hospitals. always get paid, but you won't always have a good outcome. <laughs> or you can practice what is called personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. And personalized medicine is when you sit down and look at a patient's history, look at their lifestyle, look at family what, history, which uh, tells family you history, genetics. genetics, diet, uh, exercise patterns, and any other random variables that affect this particular patient. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you say, all right, I'm going to look at the evidence-based guidelines, mm -hmm. and I'm going to look at the uniqueness of this individual person sitting mm -hmm. in front of me, and I'm going to mix and match what I know to come up with a unique and individual treatment plan for this person. Mm -hmm. that, that takes a lot more brain power and more effort. And more risk. And more risk. Because the risk is that you violate the regulatory standard and you can be challenged for that. Mm -hmm. Or in terms of recertification, mm -hmm. you know, you have to go in and sit for boards and you have mm -hmm. to reapply and they say, well, how do you treat this? And you say, well, I've got a patient I did that with. And they say, well, that's not in the manual. Right. It's exactly what they do for OB. <laughs> Yeah. For OBGYN, you have you been should, through that. I've been through it where yeah. I answered how I would treat a certain particular patient that they gave me, right. which wasn't wrong, mm -hmm. but it wasn't in the guidelines. It wasn't the standard. So I was wrong. Yeah. You know, so, by definition. So that's a, that's a huge problem. Yeah. I mean, because then you're taking all of the young doctors that are becoming board certified and you're saying, you have to follow these guidelines. Just forget about all the individual differences in people. Yeah. But now we know more about genetics, and we know that certain people don't respond to certain to certain um, treatments, mm -hmm. certain supplements, certain forms of medication. Right. And you can uh, you can now look at a um, a genetic panel that'll tell you which medications will work for you in the psychiatric field, mm -hmm. like which will, Lexapro won't, but Zoloft will, I mean, Well, that I, kind I have of a son thing. that who reacts uh, in the exact opposite to Benadryl, to what 90% of the population do. But that's because so, he has ADD and ADDers react opposite to Benadryl. Exactly. But a physician who didn't know him and didn't know his history, mm -hmm. who saw that he had certain conditions, would say, oh, take Benadryl. And then right. he'd be bouncing off the wall and they'd be going, oh my gosh, do you have ADD? Yeah, <laughs> you know? that's right. <laughs> Same thing with codeine. ADDers tend to, to, get, to be very activated by codeine or oxycodone or one of those yeah. pain medicines. So after surgery, they're like, ah, and they're like moving around and you're going, oh no, I was mm -hmm. supposed to sedate you. That wasn't, mm -hmm. that wasn't the idea. Yeah. But some people don't know they have ADD. So, so <laughs> if, you know, to me, and it's, it's a question of what is important to you. To me, it is important to straddle that line. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so I want a physician that knows the evidence-based standards, mm -hmm. but I want one that talks to me as me and knows mm -hmm. me. And that That's physician, exactly what if, we hope if, for. if that physician practices personalized medicine, then they, they do it out of their own passion and commitment, but they willingly undertake a certain standard of risk. Mm -hmm. the, the risk that they will violate the regulations, which might impact their certification and licensure, the risk that they may not be certified for payment by the insurance mm -hmm. company, uh, or, or that hospitals won't allow them to treat patients in those hospitals because they don't follow the guidelines. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a risk. 
you have to decide what your level of risk tolerance is and what relationship you want to have with a physician. And if you are content to be part of a herd in a mass production office and just sort of stand in line and move your way through <laughs> and get whatever they give you, that's okay. You, you, God bless you. Mm -hmm. If you're not content for that, then you need to advocate for yourself and have conversations with your physician or your physician's office manager or whoever you can get in front of to talk to to say, I'd like to know how these decisions are made. That's, and I advocate for, for both. I mean, yeah. having both, yeah, I know the guidelines, but I'm going to specialize them for you. Exactly. And, and that's exactly how we try to practice. Mm -hmm. It's not always perfect, but we yeah. try to practice that way. And uh, that's what you should look for, especially in somebody taking care of your hormones, which is variable based on your genetics. It's not a one size fits all. So we thank you for listening to us today and, and hope that this helps you with choosing your doctor. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.